لتجدن أشد الناس عداوة في الذين آمنوا اليهود والذين أشركوا ولتجدن
speaker will be Bob Benjamin and he will open up with a bit of prayer. To our Muslim friends, the song is Salaam Alaikum. Christian friends, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for each and every one that is here tonight. Let us pray together. We want to thank you, O oh God, that we can come and we pray that you will bring honor to yourself. Through Jesus Christ we pray this. Amen. Now what we're going to do tonight is... Okay. Glenn and I are going to be speaking. I'm going to be speaking... Shana. I'm going to be speaking as an introduction to when Glenn speaks. I don't know if this is a bit loud. Is everyone happy with the sound? I'm going to be speaking on can we trust the New Testament. I've only got 35 minutes. I want to try and give you a lot of facts. So you're going to both uh, see and hear me as I speak to you. So this is the topic before you. What is the topic got to do tonight with the crucifixion of Christ? Jesus, uh, uh, Brother Glenn will speak to that shortly afterwards. And then I will prepare the way for him. So we're going to be looking at, can we trust the New Testament? Now we're going to just look at the first uh, introduction. The New Testament forms part of the Christian Bible. And it comes from the Greek words Biblos or Biblion. Now, I don't speak for Roman Catholicism. So I will not refer to the apocryphal books which are an assortment of Jewish writings that fall between the New and the Old Testament between the years 300 BC, that is before Christ, and 100 AD after the death of Christ. This literature is in the Roman Catholic Bible but not in the Protestant Bible. As Protestants we don't accept the Apocrypha, Catholics do. Now, the New Testament and the Old Testament are really a library of 66 books. And they cover a period of 1500 years. The division between the Old and the New Testament is rooted in the appearance, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he ushers in the new and he fulfills the old. Now the theme of the Bible is clearly stated to us in 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. And I want to just read this whole portion for you. The theme of the whole Bible in these few verses. From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So there you have the theme of the whole Bible. Remember we said literature spanning 1500 years making up 66 books from the Old Testament and the New Testament, incidentally, also referred to in the Quran. Now let us go to the next part of our talk. Some people say we cannot trust the New Testament. So what I want to do is I want to look at six summary objections. I've tried to put together six reasons why people feel that this book cannot be trusted. First of all, you have what I've simply called the smokescreen or the dishonest objection. Now the smokescreen and the dishonest objection is simply this, that people refuse to commit themselves, go on to accept the, accept the message, of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know its message 
and they refused to heed it. So here we have dishonesty, and this is where I would say the category of mankind falls into, of people who are not believers. They are aware of the message, and they reject the message for no other reason that they will simply not accept it. Right, let us go on to the second approach. Some people say that there are errors in the New Testament. It's called, I call it the error objection. Now, I want to give you two examples of how this particular objection functions against the New Testament. <coughs> now, Asman Dinat wrote a book. The title was, Is All of the Bible God's Word? And on page 22, he raises what he believes are two errors. First of all, he criticizes the word virgin in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Now, incidentally, Isaiah was one of the major Old Testament prophets. And he prophesied approximately 800 years before Christ. So Ahmadita says that this is an incorrect word. Now let us follow his reasoning. Let us go on. You see, if you go to the Injil, Matthew chapter 1 verse 25, you have two verses that I want to just quickly refer to. But he, that is Joseph, had no union with her, that is Mary, until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Also, Luke 134 has Mary stating the same thing about her. So the scripture teaches, to put it politely, Mary did not know a man before Jesus was born. Now, to our Muslim friends, I am not telling you something that is strange because you are well aware that the Quran also teaches that Mary, referred to in the Quran as Maryam, was also a virgin when Isa was conceived. So the scriptures, the Injil and the Quran are in 100% agreement at this point. There are some differences in how the event occurred, but the central teaching is the same in both faith books. But secondly, I'm still referring to that book by Ahmadinat. He criticizes the word begotten. And this is the criticism that comes from, again, the Injil, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the text from the King James Version, which was written in English in the year 1611. Now what Ahmadida does is he criticizes the word begotten. He says that later Bible have excised the word. Now this word begotten, remember, comes from the 1611 edition. In Greek, the actual word is monogene. And there we alliterated it into English, and it simply means unique, special, one of a kind. So the word begotten does not mean creation. It means class. Now the New International Version, which incidentally is the Bible that I have here, paraphrases Mona Janae as one and only. And this is a correct paraphrase of the Greek. In a unique class of his own. In other words, Jesus was the unique Son, the eternal unique Son of God. And that is what the word Mona Janae conveys. The old English word, begotten, currently paraphrased because English is a growing language. It is now paraphrased as one and only, but 
are still true to the Greek text. I want to illustrate this point in another way. At home, I have three Qurans. The one by Arthur Arbery, A. Yusuf Ali, and the translation by Drs. Khan and Al Hilali. I hope I've got the pronunciation right. Now, if I want to check an ayah from the Quran, I don't check just one English translation. I check all three so that I feel are all three in agreement or not. And we are simply saying with this word begotten, see it in context and in relation to other English Bibles. Because the Greek word remains the same, English changes as long as it conveys what the original Greek text tells us. But let's go on. Now we come to our third objection. This is called the Foundation Documents Objection. Now recently the IPCI sent me this booklet called Textual Reliability, Accuracy in the New Testament. And what this little booklet seeks to do is it seeks to prove that the foundation documents of the New Testament are in fact suspect or inaccurate. In other words, the Greek text, how do we arrive at the Greek text? Before we even translate it to say the English or the Corsa or the Afrikaans. So this booklet was sent to me. I have replied to that booklet. I have sent you an email. In fact, here is a copy. I checked with the gentleman last night. They do have it. And they've kindly said they can put it onto their website. So what you get to find on the website is this. And then you're going to find the answer. We want to encourage each and every one, go and please read both. The arguments are slightly technical. To put it another way, you're going to have to put it to shed some mental sweat. But it's worth it. Both for what we're saying about the New Testament as it relates to the Quran and as it relates to the Christian community. So all of us stand to gain or lose by assessing the argument. So please, it is not an argument of the specialists or some academics. It is really something that has been done that has all of you in mind. So we really want to encourage you, go into the website, call up this book, and call up the response, and put the two together and be willing to plow a few hours into serious study, download it, and carefully read it. And both the IPCI and myself are quite willing to enter into any further engagement with yourself. Right, so we're not going to go into this one too much. It has already been addressed. Then we come fourthly to what I simply call the philosophical or illogical argument. Remember these are arguments that are raised against the trustworthiness of the New Testament. Now, this one goes simply like this. Christians are often accused of being stupid. It is claimed that we as Christians use the Bible to defend the Bible. I mean, people say, what nonsense. The English today is it's not scientific. You're using a particular book to support and defend that particular book. This is circuitous or circular reasoning. It doesn't make sense. Folk, Christians are clear. The Bible defends itself. It is sufficient for what we need to know of God and salvation. It stands in a league of its own. It stands head and shoulders above all other religious literature. It towers over all. It is the word of God written. And so, 
That is given to us a statement of humble gratitude from someone who is a Christian by the grace of God, who's come to love and who continually studies on the Word. But the Bible stands alone. It is its own defense. It does not need me nor you to defend it. It is its own defense. Right, let us go on. Now we come to the contradictions objection. People often say that there are contradictions in the New Testament. Now the IPCI, my dear friends of the IPCI, issued a very attractive booklet some time ago called The Muslim at Prayer. And on page 18, they list various scriptures which they claim are contradictions to what Christians believe. Now, let me go to the first, and again we're just looking at two. First of all, they quote John 14, verse 28. Part of the verse, in which Jesus says, For my Father is greater than I. So that part of the verse is quoted to prove that we as Christians are wrong when we affirm the deity and the divinity of Christ. Now how do we answer that? Apart from the, the normal answer, the correct answer is always the text out of context is a pretext. You got that. I think that is well known today in academic circles. But looking at John, let's go right to the beginning. The Apostle John, the very first thing he writes, he says of first importance, the very first verse, he says of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So whatever else John writes in the Gospel about Jesus, right as an opening statement, he makes it clear, this is where I stake my colors. Here I stand. Secondly, let us go on. Then also in the same book, at the same page, they put those various portions again from John's Gospel. Again to prove that Jesus is not God. How do we answer? We simply say, well, the same answer applies to the previous period. Namely, in John chapter 1, verse 1, John writes of Jesus.